This is Rachel Manella sitting with Grandmaster Nick Adler on Friday, June 17th at Master Willie Adams Dojo in Southfield, Michigan. We're going to talk about Master Adler's accomplishments in Ishinru and karate. <laughs> um, first off, could you say and spell your name for me? Nick Adler, Nick, N-I-C-K, Adler, A-D-L-E-R. Thank you. And uh, what year were you born? January 23rd, 1939. And how did you get involved in the martial arts in Ishinro? Uh, well, I basically boxed from seven years old until I got out of the service. I always boxed and I was looking for something to do. And when I went into some of the other dojos, I didn't like what they were doing. And when I went into the Ishinro dojo, it was more natural, natural stances, vertical punches. Uh, I like that way of, of, of more or less like boxing. And did you have something else to add? No. Okay. Uh, no, Ishimu was a lot different back then. Yeah. What year did you start? 1962. 1962. Who was your sensei? Ed McGrath. Ed McGrath. And so how would you trace your Ishinru lineage back to Shimabuku? Ed McGrath was one of uh, Don Nagel's uh, students, and uh, I studied with him till '67. I made uh, Shodan in '65. I made Nidan in '67, and basically uh, he was going into a different business, and he wouldn't be having time to teach. So I basically took over the school he was teaching at, but I asked him permission if we got to train with his teacher, which was Master Don Nagel. And I started with Master Don Nagel in 67, 68, uh, until his death. And I was his number one student at that time. And so, what year, was that when you opened your own dojo? In 68, I opened 68. up my own dojo. My first dojo was in Corona, Queens. Uh, my basic students were Cubans, Dominicans, Puerto Ricans. I had two white students. Uh, they were basically all played soccer. Mm. So they could kick. Now, I didn't teach kids at that time. Uh, my dojo was... Uh, had a concrete floor that was painted red, so you couldn't see the, the debris. <laughs> My classes were two and a half hours long. Mm. Uh, I didn't do it for a living. I had a good job. What did you do? I was a conductor on a Long Island Railroad for 36 years. Wow. And uh, well, you got enough competition working trains at night as far as learning self-defense. <laughs> uh, when I trained that way we did the class to everybody did the same thing and we did our basic 15 upper and 15 lower basics 25 reps on each side when we started out and we always started out with our basics first and then we did our kata and with me kata was no big deal i basically was a fighter just like my sensei nato but Nagel did good kata too. And uh, until I was like 38, when I had such a heavy schedule of bringing students to tournaments and kids and all that kind of stuff, you mellow because if I taught the kids like I taught my adults, I would have no kids and the parents would be suing me. <laughs> so, uh, but I had a, my adults were hardcore. Uh, I believed in, uh, Basic self-defense uh, was the kick and punch. Uh, wrist locks and arm bars and all of that stuff in Okinawa, they never did that. In modern age, they put that stuff into entertain. Mm. But the kata back then, if you did kata, was to main or kill. And you had, didn't have hard times. And they just, there's three types of fighting, competition, uh, an argument in a fight, and a mugging. And, you know, you're not eight feet away, bowing in. And today, it, it's, uh, 
it's so restrictive what you can do. We understand lawsuits and all that kind of stuff. But like I say, my guys at that time were all military. Mm. You know, it's a different era. But uh, the idea is that I was in AAU, I was chairman in AAU. Uh, I was in USNKF, you know, all very, very traditional judging and the whole ball rack. But the techniques are just limited to what you can do. Mm. So other than sweep or turn, throw over your hip, you can't do this, you can't do that. And everybody fights. And it's basically six techniques that you can do. They do them very well. They're very, they train very, very hard. They're very good. But I consider them athletes. Mm. Uh, martial arts right now is MMA. And it's, as the years have gone on, it's gotten better and better as far as fighting. If you've never been hit, you know, boxing, I was used to being fighting. I was used to a regular natural stance. I was used to always keeping my hands up, mm -hmm. right? I'm not keeping one hand up to figure how close you are to me and all this kind of, but I coached it. I told you that when I had people competing in those areas, you, you gotta go with what, what's going on. There's nothing wrong. But you know, these arts are like, Baseball, you have a first baseman because that's his attributes. You have a second baseman, his attributes, you have a shortstop. Each guy has attributes to play that position, mm -hmm. right? In a fight, you can't really constrict a person to what he can do. Mm -hmm. You know, so the guy who's six foot three and I'm five foot eight, this couldn't be, that I don't see many people beating that person mm -hmm. with the reach, you know? They're gonna roundhouse kick you with a lead leg, but now you can't grab it ruptures Achilles tendon, you know, snap his knee, which we understand why you can't do that. Sure. But that's what old kata was. Did you, know? you compete when you were? Oh yeah, I competed until I was 38 and I retired. Cause uh, I, I lost the edge of being able to train that hard. Right. And not wanting to hurt the student. Sure. Kata, kumite and weapons? Oh uh, yes, all, all my black belts do all three. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that my guys know the bunk guy to every cut there is. And there's three alternates, mm -hmm. depending upon the size of the individual, their age, and so forth and so on. Right. I believe in partner training. Uh, when you did weapons, you started off with toko mini no gun. Mm -hmm. There was no keyhones. So you really had no idea what the hell you were doing. You had no idea that, how to block. And then if you don't work key on, and as the rank goes, the intensity of your applications is such you pick up, mm. right? Here again, you're not supposed to remember your partners. You're here to help each other. Mm. And Nate Sensei said to me, it's a student's job to surpass his teacher. Mm. And it's a teacher's job to stay ahead of his student. So we, both people keep training. Right. I like that advice. Yeah, it was good advice. The sensei was an uh, undercover narcotics cop. Wow. And he was a federal marshal. He was 140 pounds and he was 5'9". So when there was a fight, who did they want to fight first? The guy who's 5'9", 140 pounds. Sensei was the toughest fighter I've ever fought in my life. Mm -hmm. And I fought Joe Lewis, I fought all these guys. Nobody could hit like he could hit. And I trained with him for three and a half years when I first hooked up with him. Every Saturday I drove to Jersey City, Long Island. I had a dojo, my own dojo. And uh, I did class and then two and a half hours we worked out together. Wow. Him beating me up and me trying life. And I remember one time I said to him, Sensei, what am I doing wrong? And he says, he called me my son, because he was four months older than me. And he said, my son, if I tell you that, you're gonna know as much as me. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, wow, that's very really interesting. You know, and my other sensei I studied with, like a year after that, was Weizu Sensei. And I trained with Weizu Sensei to this day. Uh, you know, he's had a stroke and he can't, do anything, 
But every year I trained with him and four times I went to Okinawa and trained with him. I'm a very big believer in cross training. I, my hobby is weapons. Mm. So I did the whole Odo seminar, which is Matayoshi system, 13 volt cards, five saga, mm. the whole thing. It's not a qualification for my students. I teach it if they want to learn it. But it's not when I test them, I don't test them on any other art that we do. Mm. I just test them on Ishiro. And, uh, you know, I trained with Odo Sensei, I trained with Oyata for 10 years. These people I trained with every year. And uh, weapons people, I, mean, I, I always enjoyed, I used to go to Vegas every year when they used to have the martial arts show. Mm. Fumio Demo Sensei were friends for 50 years. Uh, it's always good to cross train. And you see what you do in the systems. Uh, Ishimaru is a very, very natural system, and if you do it correctly, you don't get hurt. You don't hurt yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, people train and beat their students and have them do ridiculous exercises and bullshit because they don't know that mm -hmm. You know, so we'll sit here and we'll meditate for 40 minutes. Oh, that, that's great, you know. There's nothing wrong. Whatever you teach is fine. I don't correct any student in Ishimu Karate. I say, this is what I do. Mm -hmm. And this is why I do it. Mm -hmm. Simple. You may have learned one way, you know, here again, what is the experience of your sensei? Has he stayed in the state and never left? Mm. You know, has he only competed in Ishimu events? We competed in the bloodiest tournaments going, you know? And we were very well respected because we went to all black dojos, all white dojos. I trained with Moses Powell, who was jiu-jitsu. He was a, one of the meanest people in the world. I was the only white student in the whole black school. Mm. Uh, you know, but this is what we did. And they, everybody respects you. Uh, I don't try to change anybody. One of my biggest proudness is that I never lost a student that left me and went to somebody else. Mm -hmm. I threw two students out in all my years. And I ain't gonna say who. But the idea is that this is what I do. If you like it, you stay. If you don't, there's no hard feeling. Just don't badmouth me, then then I'm gonna be at your door. You know? How many people do you or do you know or how many people do you think you've promoted to black belt? Probably around 300. 300? Right. So, so yeah. and uh, I, before my school closed and stuff like that, I taught, you know, six days a week. Right. And I taught the classes. So I taught kids' classes, beginners' classes, always keep in touch with your student body. Mm -hmm. I ran a dojo that had 800 students. We got a check from EFC for, you know, no, eighty thousand dollars a month. Wow, that was not counting the merchandise, right? But that that was strictly business. I had forty hardcore karate people. Right. The other guys were, oh, what a job! The way you walked across the floor, it's unbelievable, and you didn't get lost. <laughs> <laughs> what time period was this? This was uh, five years ago. Oh, wow. What happened is uh, my uh, daughter died of cancer, right? So, cancer. So sorry. And then my wife died six months after that mm. of, of Bavarian cancer. And we were childhood sweethearts. We went to school together. And uh, like I just kind of stepped away for the next two years. Let my students always. You know, kept me involved, mm -hmm. and, and then I come back, and, and when COVID hit, it wiped us out. Yeah, you know, so the school I was teaching that they don't necessarily no more. I just taught the school. That's all I did. I walked in, taught. Uh, then I ended up teaching ten black belts in a garage. Mm. You know, wow. And uh, we work out in the garage, and then in the summer we work out at the end of the airport, which is the airport's closed. It's fresh air. You know, and stuff like that. 
So, you know, like Miss Garrow, she's been with me 50 years probably. Mm. And uh, she, I don't know what she said, but I, I treated everybody the same, man, women, you know, what, 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 whatever you were gonna, if you're gonna get into a situation of self-defense, it's basically gonna be a man, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, what to do about it. And, you know, technique always wins. Mm. You know? But if you don't drill it and work it, you know, pick up the degree of your attack as the person gets more proficient, right? If you keep working at the same pace with the same person, right? that really doesn't help you. Right. You know? I mean, the average Okinawan is five feet tall, four foot nine. When Shunabuka came here, I remember holding the door and he walked out under my arm with his hat on. <laughs> That's how small he was. But he was snap, very, very powerful. And Nagel's kata is totally different than what we do today. Mm. You no, know, and, and I asked for permission so I could train with Wazer Sensei because we couldn't compete in Okinawan tournaments and win mm -hmm. to his kata. He said, fine, he had no problem with it. You know? But I never took rank from Wazer Sensei that I didn't already have from, uh, right? And when Mitchum promoted me to Ninth Don, at one of his dinners, when I went to Tennessee the next year, I said, Sensei, I really appreciate it, but I can't accept this from you because my Sensei's still alive. <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't do that to him. But, but it was an honor by, you know, Mitchum, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I trained with all four of the pioneers. Each one had their own skill level. But a lot of these guys, they, they didn't go outside their, their door. And I, I think that's not true. I've never stopped my students from training with anybody, you know? If you'd like what they do better, hey, that's fine. That's fine. fine. It's your office, sir. Thank so, you. Hey, um, I know Wooly probably 50 years. Yeah, I want to talk to him as well for this project. Yeah. You were inducted into the IOF Ishinru Hall of Fame in 1988. What mm. What did that mean to you? Well, at that, that, that time it was pretty good because it was really very, very selective. And as the association got bigger and now, you, you, and now you're inducting more people into the Ishinru Hall of Fame mm -hmm. because you want to build your tournament. Not that these guys are not worthy of being get bigger, so but you know it, it's it's kind of different. But uh, the Israel Hall of Fame they do a nice job, they work very hard at it, and uh, we used to go down there with an army, and uh, Mitchum used to pick us up at the airport, hmm. and so a different the different thing, and uh, you know I brought I introduced Willie to down there and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. And Mass Adams is, you know, one of the best martial artists you ever see. And it's the same thing. He's tr cross trained with many different people, but he does this room. Mm -hmm. And he does it, it. All his people know what they're supposed to be doing in their contest or weapons or, or whatever it may be. His women and his men are both equal. It's the same. It's just as mine. When I started my association, the Centurions, my association consisted of a black person, a Puerto Rican, a Jew, right? And two Germans, me and my son. So, I mean, we were very versatile, you know? And uh, so, uh, if you knew what you're supposed to do, I, I promoted you. You only paid $100 for black belt mm. and you never paid me again. Wow. I never took another dime from, you paid your dues. But that charge never charged like knee down was two hundred dollars on that was, mm -hmm. but if that's your, your living, I can understand that. Sure. You know, but if it's not your living, you know, I can't see, you know, sending three hundred dollars to some Okinawa that I'm senior to. Right. You know? And uh, most of the Okinawans in Okinawa, the, the arts are drying up in Japan, Okinawa. They've become so uh, 
uh, structured, Japan has like birth rates 1.3. Mm -hmm. So they're not having children. When you're 23, you graduate college. Then all you do is work. And you work from nine to five or nine to nine. And the same thing's happening in Okinawa because all the Japanese school teachers teach in Okinawa. Mm. So instead of the Okinawans living now to these bright old ages, they're having heart attacks, strokes, and stuff like that because the workload, they never, mm. they never relax. Mm. And you see these guys when they're going home, they're going to sleep. Yeah. So, you know, so you, and the economy is so costly that most people have to work. Right. You know, but you know, it's like you, you, you have children and you go to work and you're making a thousand dollars a week and you're paying six hundred dollars for childcare. Right. And you haven't bought no clothes yet because for your business. So, I mean, it's, you know, yeah. you're beating a dead horse and then you end up in a divorce because you never see each other or you're too tired to be with each other. So times change. My wife used to work when we first started. Uh, when I did karate, and I, all my tournaments were very, very successful. Mm. All my camps were very, very successful. We never lived on that money unless we bought something. I, we mm. lived on my salary. Right. Right, which was a good salary, you know. I, my pension, you know, was basically what a lot of people make for a living. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, and I love to teach. If you don't... You know, Otherwise, you, you get stale. You don't teach. Yeah. And you keep patient, otherwise I'd probably kill someone. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, I was wondering if you had any p opinions about governing bodies of Ishinru or the martial arts in general. All of these governing bodies, we supported all of them. And the Centurions think, was different. Think, what's that? The, your Centurions was different, right? Yeah, it was insured, even though I was Nagel said so, okay. a student, and stuff like, my people were more structured. Nagel just wanted basically a dojo to fight, mm -hmm. and and there was really no structure, and uh, you know I couldn't see. He promotes sometimes people just to get rid of him. You know, so I don't have to see this guy you know, anymore, <laughs> and. I don't think you should be this high rank if you're not teaching and you don't have students. Why, what am I promoting you for? You haven't promoted your right. You don't have no students, mm. you're not teaching. And I don't promote anybody other than my students. Okay. I don't co-sign, I don't. I promote my students alone. Mm. And that's my. All these different associations, I'm sure they they believe they're doing correct, mm. right? But most of these associations don't have a quality control. They don't, they're afraid of the young people. I'm 84, I got a 27 year old guy, that's phenomenal. I'm gonna have him teach the same subject I taught him because he does it better. Mm. I think a good leader uses the people that he has that are more qualified to do the job than him. Mm. Now, if the government of the United States ever did that, it would be phenomenal. This is the problem is you pick a guy that has no qualification whatsoever to be ahead of something. Why? <laughs> you know, because he has 20 more students to put in your association. So that's what I, I, I basically don't like. AAU, the same people that were in AAU when I started are the same leaders. And uh, AAU stands for? Sports, American Athletics. Yeah. yeah. So, USA NKF, the same people hmm. were in charge. They've never changed. So how are you using your young people other right. than competing? You know, if I got a guy who's world champion in kata he should be teaching mm. at my school seminar when i when i bring him in right if this guy's a good fighter this guy's a good communicator 
this guy is a better uh, teacher in getting a subject over. Mm -hmm. Use these people. Right. Don't be jealous of them. You know, and, and this way, the, the, the older people feel like they 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 wanted. You know, they don't have to. Oh Christ, we're going to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's like when Kichiro Shimabuku comes to the United States. Oh my God. Or if you go, oh my God, it's the same. You spend 20 minutes on learning to say Sun Tzu. <laughs> you know, things like that. It's like, you know, uh, you know, I think I do a really good seminar and stuff like that. But I use my people that can do something better than me. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're supposed to. Sure. Right? I mean, they've done the repetitions. They're going to be able to kick faster than me. But I also teach the older people. This is El Kunam Anishimu. Front kick, blade kick, step over kick, knee kick, thrust kick. You can do this at any age. Okay? If you see me do a kick to the head, please take a picture. And you best be sitting in that chair when I do it. <laughs> um, do you think that popular culture, such as television shows and movies, has an effect on established dojos and systems? Oh, you know, sure. I mean, the Karate Kid, uh, which is very good. I mean, the technique and stuff like that is yeah, very dojo good. Room. It's got, it's got, it, well, whatever it's called. Uh, basically, uh, the technique is good. And the what they're trying to promote, you know, is all good quality stuff, you know. But then you have other movies, you know. I mean, just first of all, you wouldn't bring your kids to it, to, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the old movies. But yeah, you know, the panda movies, because they, they, they got a good solid message and stuff like that. I don't think there's anything basically wrong, wrong with that. Do they, do you think they bring students in? Not like they used to, mm -hmm. you know, you have to do different ways of advertising things. It's not that they, uh, you, you, especially with kids, you have to entertain them. They have to have fun and they have to not know that they're learning something, mm -hmm. you know. And the idea is that, but you're teaching them discipline, you're teaching them coordination, you're teaching them sportsmanship. There's a lot of good good qualities to it but when you get to a certain rank and stuff they have to go out into the ocean you know you got you've been swimming in the lake you know you've been swimming in your pool it's a little different out there if they like them you got people that don't like that compete you got people that train very hard but they're the worst testing people in the world mm -hmm. you can't hold that against them you know it's like when you judge this is the way I'm old school. When I judge a tournament and I sit in the tournament, if I'm at a Battle of Atlanta, if that guy does not scare me with his technique, I'm not going to get my arm up. Mm. I don't care. If he can't hurt me, what am I giving him a high mark for? Right. If you watch synchronized kata and synchronized kata, these people work very, very hard. And then they do the application has nothing to do with the kata, you know, and they show tremendous control. But remember, you're not getting hit. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to realize that there's no, if you're a brown belt and up, there is no fear of competing. None. I got five people to protect me. Mm -hmm. Right? I can only do six techniques. I got a 26 foot ring. So my chances it may accidentally get a bloody nose, but chances of, no, I don't, not saying that we're gonna go back to old school because basically different times, different eras, you know. We're not out there with flintlocks shooting people either, mm -hmm. you know. But, you know, discipline to hard work and so forth and so on. But then, they, then you become a coach too. Okay, this is the attributes for this guy. You know, he's five, four, he weighs 130. He's not going to fight like a guy like Joe Lewis, mm -hmm. you know? And, but you know, when in Joe Lewis's time, when we fought, there was six people in the black belt division. Right. Now there's 40. <laughs> yeah. Right? And then, and then you have heavyweight and lightweight. This is the way you line two lines up. 
split them, and that was the heavyweight division. That was like, so I mean, now you got four different weight divisions. Mm -hmm. You got aged, you know, yeah. So like, it's you know, it's changed. And I think there's a time to not compete. Mm -hmm. When I was 38, I, then I really got into kata, really got into application, because now this was my interest, mm -hmm. you know. And, you know, I studied with Matej, I studied with every, okay, no matter which way, you can only kick, punch, and throw it in so many ways. I don't care what you call it. Tang Saro, Shitaru, Wataru. You, know, you can only hit in so many ways. And the guys who trained the hardest mm -hmm. win. Uh, when the, we went to, the first time we went, to Okinawa with Trias, I was style head for USKA at that time. The toughest fighters on Okinawa were the Wichiru people, mm. and train hard. So, I mean, they their katas are, are for real. They're they're meant old school, but they weren't used to us guys who fought and open a style. Mm. You know, they weren't used to a front kick, roundhouse kick. You know, yeah, they, they weren't used to. A, back fist, reverse punch, fuck it. They weren't used to the combinations, but I mean, if you threw one technique, they, they'd kill you. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just different. So you may have beat them, quote, with points, but if it was for real, would have, somebody was going yame. Right. You know, now today, remember the minute you touch them, yame. Right. Yeah, so, sometimes it's not really a, and, a you know, point. And if you bring students, students should be ready to go into a tournament. Mm -hmm. Don't just throw all your people in there. Because you, you you win two trophies and you lose five students. Listen, let me figure this out now, money-wise. <laughs> that's, that's not a smart move. What are your thoughts, or have you heard of the term McDojo's? And no, really. would you like me to describe them for you? Uh, no, I can imagine what they are. Any thoughts on those types of organizations? Uh, no, because it, it's not my interest. I used to run, I used to run five Jerome Mackey schools. Mm. And Jerome Mackey was the first business schools in New York City. And we had television, television. we were on every uh, TV show, cartoon show there was. And then that phone room would light up mm. and people would come in in droves. When the first dojo I opened up in Bayshore for them, I taught Kung Fu, I taught Karate, I taught Jiu Jitsu, I taught all these different arts until we hired people to fill those. So all I used to do is change the uniforms at the time. And then I'm teaching a Kung Fu class and I find this guy, you know, he's a master in Kung Fu. <laughs> I did, you know, I hired him. Wow. And, and and that's what we did, you know. But Jerome Aggies at the time, he paid $35,000 for a franchise, hmm. you know. And it, but we made a lot of money. And he got locked up uh, for mail fraud, Jerome Aggies, so that all the dojos went under. Right. And, uh, and then he came out and opened up a security business. Figure that one out. <laughs> oh. um, what do you see as the future of karate and Ishinryu in the United States? Well, if the economy is going the way it is, I, I don't think it's bright for any anything like this. People are not going to have the money to send their kids to these things. Maybe if you have a Y or you know clubs like that or college and stuff like that. But otherwise, it's really hard. I used to have a student, she trained weapons with me. I really will tell you, right? Her rent in Manhattan was $35,000 a month. And they toured everything. Boxing, it, whatever. I remember going down there, she wanted me to fight her students. And you know, they did these 360, 740, you know, kicking routines. You know, and you just step in, and the guy mm -hmm. says, uh, you got to back up a little bit, you know. <laughs> oh, I'm not backing up. I'm not going, I'm not going nowhere. I mean, 
Ishinru was always forward, mm. never backward. All the years I fought, I went left or right or straight ahead. I never went back. Uh, do you have any particular tournaments that you remember or moments that? Well, I never threw a losing tournament. The Samurai Spirit was a classic tournament. You know, Japanese Okinawan, right? We did the Hakamas, we did the whole ball of whack. I paid my center referees. It was all USAKF rules, mm. you know, and everyone was, I just got tired of it, you know, because it's a tournament promoter. You have to kiss everybody's ass and you have to go to everybody's tournament. So you have no time for yourself. Right. When you were competing, are there any that stick out to you? Wins, losses? Oh, they, I won more than I've lost. And I fought in the Battle of Atlanta. I fought, I fought all the big tournaments all through the country. Yeah. Like I say, I won more than I, I lost. And, you know, I fought guys like Joe. I fought Joe Lewis and won the Grand Championship at the tournament. And then he had to fight the defending Grand Champion. And the champion was Joe Lewis. Mm -hmm. He was sitting in the hotel room, you know, all day long. I had like six fights, and he got back then. He got hit, mm -hmm. you know. So after sitting there for three hours before the finals, you were like a stiff board. It, was, it wouldn't have mattered. Joe would have still beat me, you know. But I mean, you were like, all right, you know. And Joe, he was one of my best friends, you know. Uh, he was way ahead of his time on training and technique and stuff. And he supposedly studied with Bruce Lee and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but way, way ahead of his time. But you know, he was a wrestler in school and he studied with uh, Shimabuku's brother. Mm. Izu. And if you ever see films of Izu, Izu was a, a younger Shimabuku. Mm. Wow. Yeah. And you know, and they all had good jobs. They all taught on the military base. And they made a lot of money. You don't forget, Shimabuku Sensei sent both of his kids to J J university mm. in Japan. Right. <laughs> well, you know he was making money. So, as of right now, how many years have you been involved with Ishinro? 62 to now. 62 years. No. Oh, from 1962, so 60 years. 60 years, yeah. Wow. Training all the time, yeah. not, not visiting. Right. You, know, you, you get these six times, seven times. They don't teach. Right. But they've been an organization, so everybody has to get promoted, and they pay for their rank. Mm. The guy I threw out was the sixth time with me, and he went with Kishiro, and he had to pay for every rank. Mm -hmm. And then he left Kichiro because he's going to get promoted higher. Hmm. But, but that's that's economics. You know? All I know is if I promoted you to a rank, you deserved it. If you're just in my dojo, you can't go higher than six time. Hmm. You're not out teaching. You're not you know right. teaching in my dojo. It's like guys when when they want to teach, they only want to teach the rank. Mm. Oh, no. You see that stumbling white belt out there? You know, the kid going in a different direction. That's your student. <laughs> well, I think that's all my questions for you. Okay. I really no, don't blackmail me. No, I really appreciate this. And just, you know, you took over a nice group of people. Thank you very and, much. And, uh, you know, 